Hi, John, and hello, dear viewers. John, it's such a pleasure to see you today again. Um, just to let our viewers know how we know each other and how awesome you are, though you do not need, you do not need the super glorious introductions because your name kind of speaks for your, for itself. And and I mean the, the things you've done all over the world and so many people that you inspired. I'm sure that I'm sure that uh, you know you already have a lot of and a lot of people that do know you. But I, I would love to introduce you in a way of where we met because I think it kind of shows of who you are more than just necessarily what you've done because what you've done is amazing. But I want to talk more today about who you are and what drives you. And of course, we'll get into your secret sauce of life and you know, and the inspiration of what you do and, and you know how you do it. But we met at the Powder Mountain. And Powder Mountain is this amazing community in Utah, um, on the mountain, obviously. Um, and it really is united by people that have open hearts and, and have an, are motivated to do better for others and then do then well for themselves. And, and, and people that are really kind and considerate. And to me, that's kind of how you are. I was really amazed that you represented a lot of, of the ethos of the mountain brains. And that's the beauty of it. You know, we, it, was a, it was a blockchain uh, summit. And it was so great to see you inspiring from your perspective, um, you know, blockchain um, entrepreneurs and fund managers. And I thought how amazing it is. And you integrated and connected with everybody. You have this amazing ability to just be and be open and very inspiring. I think just basically being next to you feels feels opening and wonderful and you always have this you I've, I've observed you you have this ability to to gather up people around you and and help them feel heard and good and have this magical uh wisdoms that you just share so kindly and so unegoistically so anyhow but you also olympic champion right so you have a gold medal right silver Silver. Well, it's it's a medal, and I was I was looking at at speed skating, okay, and it looks terrifying. So when when you were talking, I I don't think that I I anchored to how scary and dangerous it is that when you glide on that edge of the blade, basically at the speeds to where. Like, I'd be scared to be running on my two feet that way. And I don't even know if it's possible. So so uh, when I actually looked up at it, I thought, wow, that's so amazing. Because what I realized is that that precision that you were talking about, that, that, that specific thing, it's so to a point, it's almost like a needle. And how that needle basically expands all the opportunities for you. And I'm sharing that because that's what it meant for me. So, but... I want to ask you about this. You've been traveling US in the last year and you've been going everywhere in your RV and your life has shifted um, in quite a bit of a ways uh, from a different type of, of traveling. So what, what, what do you see is happening in our country as far as gatherings and places where people get together to 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 hear you speak are is that even happening in the world would you please share that because i looked online and it's i i, I know that there are some private events and places that are happening but is there something that is public or we're not seeing it because i do believe what what you're doing is so important. I do believe gathering is so important. And that personal inspiration that you were able to communicate is in, in person by being there and connecting with people. I think we cannot replicate that via virtual gatherings. So would you update us on, on what's happening in America as far as that? <laughs> it's been a really long, strange journey. <clears throat> um, with COVID, I you know, struggling with what was happening, like being stuck at home. And, you know, part of my 
value system is new experiences and, and getting together with people that are smart to gather ideas and share ideas. And none of that was happening, right? The, all speaking engagements were canceled or at least deferred. Give my clients credit, they all just deferred. And so I was stuck at home for a couple of months and, and this thing started happening. And there's a metaphor from, from filmmaking. They call it the dolly zoom or the vertigo effect. And this is where, uh, this is where they zoom the camera backwards, even as they zoom in with the lens. So whatever is in the fore, whatever they focused on stays the same size, but everything in the background grows bigger. So like the sunset grows or the buildings get bigger, right? And, and what also recedes is the things in the foreground in front of the person in the uh, frame, they disappear. And this is, I think what happened with COVID is the COVID event, it, it got bigger the farther away we got from it. But day-to-day -day details disappeared because everything was so routine that we started losing ourselves. We started losing the present, right? There was the event and then there was this humdrum routine day-to-day. -day. And for me, I mean, April and May, June, I don't remember them. Like other than a couple of news stories, nothing personally happened that was of significance. And so I was losing time, which is, you know, the core of what I work on and research and talk about. And I was like, I have to, I have to do something. Like I, I can't continue to lose time due to this, uh, this change from pandemic. So normally I used to travel the world and speak and meet people and my lifestyle was exactly what I would hope. So I decided to sell everything, move into the, uh, buy an RV. And so I sold everything, all my cars, my condo, all my belongings, and I moved into the RV and started traveling about the US doing the two things I love, having adventures, going to new places and meeting up with friends, socially, uh, safely distance. Um, and it was the dolly zoom, the vertigo effect ended. And those 12 weeks felt like 10 years. And there were so many memories packed into such a short period. And all of this is really just proof in, about the book that I'm working on around how do you expand time. So book, you're working on the book. How far are you in that? When, when can we see the book? Yeah, I mean, I'd say it's mostly written in my head. There's a little problem with working on the areas of time perception and neuroscience is that every time I speak to my neuroscientist friends like David Eagleman or Moran Surf or on the flow side, Stephen Kotler, they all say the same thing, which is everything I'm about to tell you is wrong. It's just less wrong than last time. And then they'll remind me that we've learned more about the brain in the last 18 months than in all of human history. So it's a receding finish line to some extent. Like every time I speak to them, I learn something new that's significant that changes some of the inputs or outcomes in the book. So at some point I just have to declare a finish line and, and be done with it. I think that'll be in a couple of months. And then, you know, I have to wait to publish and all of that. But it's called Counterclockwise, Designing Endless Summers. Interesting. What, what did you say, counterclockwise? Yes. And then what was the other phrase? Designing Endless Summers. Oh, wow. Okay, it's wow. Prescriptive book, the first and only of its kind, of how to slow, stop, and reverse the perceived acceleration of time that most adults feel and experience the endless summers of your youth again. Oh my goodness, it sounds the, so beautiful. Endless summers of your youth. Oh, oh goodness. Well, so it's interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a book that concentrates and expands on basically the psychohacking um, tool, right? And then it proposes uh, many, many tools. Um, I've, I've, been, I've been dabbling with that myself a little bit um, as well. Perception of, perception of our reality and how we experience everything. It really is an interesting subject. My, my, you know, my, my daughter is eight years old and talking to her about time now understanding that it's not quite defined, right? And it, it, there are so many variables that are associated with that trying to uh, verbalize that to her and communicate instead of just kind of having a mental 
pockets and awarenesses has been really, really interesting. So I really appreciate that you are writing book about it because it really expands it. I mean, for me, I just have a couple of tools that I'm using. So uh, very, very exciting. <laughs> um, so so you, you right now traveling still or you guys are still on the road? You and your wife, right? Uh, me and my girlfriend, we are uh, house sitting in this beautiful house here in Las Vegas. Uh, but uh, about every week, we do a side trip for a couple of days. So we've gone to Sedona, Grand Canyon, Zion, uh, Brian Head, uh, Mojave Desert, Death uh, Valley. There's so many places within driving distance from Vegas. So for now, this is a like a home base uh, until we get back on the road. I've been really enjoying your updates on Facebook with your beautiful pictures and the way you settings. And I really appreciate that you guys have been stopping and enjoying the unique surroundings and, and you've been sharing the perspective of, of your experiences uh, visually with the beautifully designed pictures, so, you know, captures and also verbally. And it's been really wonderful to see that because I think that for a lot of people that follow you and with whom you connected and your friends, it, it kind of shows that it's there and there's a way to do what you're doing and also sharing the beauty of our uh, our reality and how beautiful, you know, the, the salts when you went to Salt Lake City, right? And it was, it looked like you were on another planet and, yeah. and, you know, and it's from your perspective of the side, it's, it, it really is wonderful. And so, so I want to talk to you about kind of a fear. Okay. So, and I want to talk to you about fear because again, when I was looking at, at the speed and that, you know, and, and what it takes to go so fast that, that, at the, at the knife of this key of the, what do you call it? The, you know, the, yes. Um, you must, how do you, how do you go through that fear of everything that is associated with it? Because it is very highly uh, dangerous. It, it, it seems very dangerous sport and to be one of the best in the world and to train so much, it seems that you constantly have to break through the barriers and fears. And so how do you do it? How did you do it? And how do you do it now? Yeah, great question. And it, uh, I would say it gets back to, and all of us will eventually get back to time, but <clears throat> the, the reality is, and you've heard this quote, uh, this quote, life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. Okay, that has more reality to it than I think the whoever originally brought it up knew. And it has to do with the brain science of the flow state. And so the flow state, for those who don't know, it's your peak performance zone. It's a place where you do your very best at anything. It can be a conversation, it could be love, it can be speed skating, it can be anything. It's your very best self, but it has a couple of things in common. The first is time stops being measured by our brain. And so you'll say things like, where did that three hours go? Or, or time stood still or both, because when you're not measuring time, you don't really have any way to articulate what you're seeing or not seeing. Uh, and then you know, the other thing is that you, you develop this very narrow focus on what's important for whatever this thing is. And risk is a really powerful trigger to get you into the flow state. So this is where something like speed skating or riding the one wheel on the salt flats at 20 miles an hour or climbing a mountain or uh, canyoneering or any of the things that I tend to do when I get to a new location start to trigger some risk calculated, but some risk starts to trigger to get into that zone, that flow state. And when you're in the flow state, this is where it gets back to time, your, your mental camera, your memory writing mechanism, because your sense of time is constructed and is constructed of memories. So think of it as a stack of Polaroids. You're taking a Polaroid every couple of seconds. It might not keep any detail, it might throw the Polaroid away, but when there's risk involved, when you get into the flow state, the camera frame rate speeds up and it writes more stuff down. Uh, the amygdala is the one that wakes up the hippocampus to do this. Um, and the amygdala, which is your risk sort of uh, arbiter, 
says, don't ever do that again or always do that again. So that's when it wants to wake up and that's when it starts the memory writing process. When it starts the memory writing process, you learn more, you keep more data and you actually accelerate your development into whatever it is. And so whether it was speed skating or into my career or into uh, learning to speak in front of large audiences, having that risk factor leading to the flow state, leading to faster learning curve, ultimately creates the possibilities of expanding time and having endless summers again. Your eight-year-old, by the way, right now is at the height of where most people experience the longest summers of their lives. And there's a reason for that. Her camera is always running at a high frame rate because everything is new, it's unique, it's potentially risky, it's exciting, it's scary. And so her camera frame rate is like this right now, all the time, 24 seven. So summers last forever, but we as adults want to get comfortable. We, we seek safety and comfort, but those are actually antithetical to time and, and memory. And so as adults, we need to keep creating these calculated risks in our lives of taking on new activities, new challenges, new relationships, whatever it might be. Because when we do that, that's when time slows down. And so that's a, the core of the book. Wow, that's amazing. I, I was just downloading every single word you were saying and, and trying to program that into kind of like an operational method, if you would. It was amazing. Thank you so much. And very methodical. So do you measure time? Do you look at time and, you know, see what time it is? No, even though I have, well, I used to have a clock wall with 52 clocks on it that I used as a backdrop for things like this, I stopped replacing the battery. So none of them even kept time. Um, I'll answer that in a different way in that chronos, which is the Greek word for clock time, is constructed and it's artificial. So it's real to the extent that these intervals of say seconds or, or minutes, which by the way, the minute is fairly arbitrary, but it is somewhat based on heart rate, right? We roughly have a heartbeat about 60 times um, per minute. This is where our anchoring to time comes from is this sort of physical emulsion happening in our bodies. But chronos time doesn't mean anything. I mean, we pretend it does, but it doesn't mean anything. And, and the entire phrase of the book can be summarized in one sentence. And by the way, the Greeks had another word for time, more important. They used it 70% of the time in all books, including the Bible or anything else you read, they called it Kairos. Kairos is human time. It's the way we actually experience time. So if you've ever gone to a long, boring meeting and you're chatting with somebody you don't really know and you're scratching your head trying to remember whether they had kids or not, and you're looking at your watch after it seems like three hours and you go, oh God, it's only been 20 minutes. And then your best friend flies in from out of town. You haven't seen him or her in a long time. You have a cocktail, you start chatting and you're like, oh, it's been about 20, it's been three hours, right? This is the nature of time. It speeds up, it slows down, it stops. This has everything to do with how much memory you're writing. You're not writing memory with an acquaintance because you don't really care and you don't have to remember. You're gonna keep all of these artifacts with your best friend because they matter so much to you. Um, this is the nature of Kairos time. So what's happening in our lives is that we're writing these memories and if we're not storing them and not able to retrieve them, we're naturally not alive at all. So if you've ever driven to your workplace back in the day when we used to do that, and you found yourself in the parking lot, not knowing how you got there, well, that's because your brain decided there was nothing new here, nothing to write down. And so it just didn't write anything down. And I would argue you're actually dead. Like if you can't remember it, you weren't there. If you weren't there, you might as well have been dead. And so this is the danger that we run into on our particularly in COVID routines now, is letting too much of that creep into our lives. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. Uh, I, I, can, I can relate to that. I've been for many years now, psychohacking and biohacking, you know, that's something that for me personally, I, I try to constantly implement and find new operational methods and improving our body and our minds, you know, just to just to kind of extend that summers. I really love what you said about extending the summer of youth because it does feel that way. When you really, when you're really in that moment in the flow, it does feel like you have the same associations and feelings and stuff. What a beautiful, beautiful metaphor. So, so do you anymore now get on this? It's not the ski, it's skate, right? The skate is the proper way of saying, okay. I know for interaction, it's kinky, you know, so, but uh, um, do you, do you 
do you still work out on on skates and do, do you go fast on them? <laughs> so, I mean, the last time I skated was two years ago. I had to do it for a <clears throat> promotional video for one of my clients. And it's hard. I mean, that sport is hard. Um, so no, I don't skate. It's, it, 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 it's sort of like if you were an accountant for your whole life and then somebody's like, hey, do you still do spreadsheets? It's like, no, no. that's work. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> um, but I do ski. Um, I love to ski. It's probably one of my favorites. And I still um, am a competitive cyclist. So I was always a bike racer along with speed skating. I did go to the world championships in that sport as well. And that's the way I keep in shape now. I ride most days. Even now? Yeah. Okay. A new hobby, which, uh, you know, back to risk and and type two fun. Have you ever heard of type two fun? No, what is that? Type two fun is the kind of fun that is preceded by suffering. So, <laughs> so for example, you could go to a ski resort and take the lift up and catch the first run down and get some good powder snow. Lovely, it'll be, it'll be lovely. Or you can go to the back country and hike for two hours, sweating, <laughs> freezing, sweating, whatever, like you're both, right? And you get to the top and you have essentially the same run. Which of those two is going to be vastly superior? Oh yeah, oh, number oh. two, obviously, right. <laughs> So I always try to incorporate some type two fun into wherever I'm going. And so, uh, and sometimes it happens by accident, like in the salt flats, I rode my one wheel. I may or may not have been wearing clothes um, <laughs> way out into the distance. And then the battery died. And so I had to carry it back. This is 40 pounds. Like this is no small task and I'm barefoot. How, how far was the walk? I'd say a couple miles. Okay. Yeah, three, three miles maybe. So a couple of days ago, I was in uh, the Mojave Desert and I took my fat bike that has big fat tires and I, I carried it up a seven foot high, 700 foot high sand dune <laughs> and then I rode it down and proceeded to crash multiple times. Um, but it was amazing. Like it was sort of like powder skiing, like, you know, it's untracked sand and it was really cool. Okay. So did, have you skied this, this year so far in this season? I have not yet, no. Okay. No. Right. I, just, I actually have, today I'm taking a new set of skis in to get the bindings put on, but I'll be going in the next few weeks. Where are you going? Where do you go? What's your best favorite place in the US to go to? I mean, it's hard to beat Powder Mountain. Oh. There's no lines. Yeah. There's tons of back country area to go find powder, even if it's been days since the last snow. I, uh, yeah, I love it. I mean, I've been going there since I was a little kid. My parents lived in Eden for 20 years and they live now just in North Ogden, so. Even before it was uh, the Conchessa uh, Wave Summit, yes. Yeah. Well, that's exciting, yeah. I, I think it's just so beautiful there. I, we are lucky Justin's family lives in Utah, so we get to, uh, in Salt Lake City, so we get to visit and then we'll, you know, we'll drive around, yes. Uh, I, I do hope that, um, Pier Summit will happen in March. Uh, so is there still snow? In March? Yeah. Probably. yeah. That's actually probably the best time to ski there. Really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, and it's supposed to be on 20th of March. So I'm, I'm hoping that Jared will, uh, will keep it and we can okay. celebrate uh, uh, spring equinox because it's the 20th of March right. out of the in, in the beautiful yurt and then go and enjoy skiing and connecting so Jared if you're watching <laughs> we we need that and we want that and we very much so will go <laughs> yes and so what would be your what would be your advice um for for viewers that um, that would kind of relate to how to adapt to the current reality because everything got kind of a thrown, thrown upside down and and the, while people are hoping and talking about going back to normal, um, the no, new normal is unknown and right. that's the reality of life. And so, what would be like one advice that you could share um, that you think that would be really helpful to just kind of uh, keep in mind as we are all transitioning to and establishing that new norm? Yeah, this will be, it'll be a bit of a paradox, but I would say plan some spontaneity. So, 
So next weekend, if you don't have any firm plans, go somewhere. If there's an old friend you haven't seen in a while, just get in the car and drive them. Tell them you're coming so that, you know, and sit out in the yard, you know, be safe about it. Um, unless you both know you've been quarantined for 14 days. So most of the friends I visited, well, we've been quarantined and most of them had been locked up for months. So, you know, we didn't have to keep a social distance because we hadn't been around anybody. Yeah. You know, the most dangerous thing I did for months was go to the grocery store, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, if you've got friends you trust that are, have quarantined, then yeah, go visit, you know? I had a really amazing experience a couple of years ago after giving a talk on time. A man waited quite a while to come talk to me and, and he was pretty teary eyed actually. And he said, you know, I, it's Friday, it's 4 p.m. I was supposed to actually get on a flight to go to a convention in Florida this weekend. And after hearing you talk about the value of our time and where to invest it, I realized that I've been to this convention before. I've been to multiple conventions. I, I don't need to go. He's like, so I called my wife. I said, I just canceled my tickets. I asked her to load up the car. And when I get home, we're driving across the state of Iowa for three hours to go visit their great grandparents who they've never met and never would have if today hadn't happened. And I think that, you know, that's exactly the kind of thing we're talking about. Who yeah. in your life do you need to connect with? Just get in the car and go like, or go out into nature or, you know, find a national park or a state park or somewhere beautiful and go out and camp or just visit for the day. But you will remember that day. Yeah. You're not going to remember all these other days. Yeah, absolutely. So just kind of a get out and go and, and, and do and enjoy. What I really appreciate is that as we, as we all got pulled back into kind of our seats, if you would, it's almost, it's almost that we now had like open opportunity to, to have so much excess of, of time right like uh, people all of a sudden don't have plans and it's okay to work from home and there's no timelines into when you send a business email right like if, right. if you're up at 3 a.m in the morning and you're productive you're cranking up and then maybe during afternoon instead of feeding into those office hours you can get on a bike and go ride a bike because you got your stuff done because you woke up at 3 you don't have to wait for anybody anymore ever it, it just that's what's the amazing part um part of it connecting with nature has been one of the whole best benefits um, For sure it seems it seems to me so okay so now this is i think is a fun question what is your favorite innovation that you think right now that you are watching because i know that you you watch a lot of you you watch a lot of progress in in a lot of in a lot of ways. So what is that you that's your favorite innovation and why you think it's kind of going to change the way um, we create our and leave our new norm? Well, that's a great question. <clears throat> well, I'll answer with a an easy answer. Maybe there'll be a bigger answer. Um, but I was recently introduced to a guy named Jeffrey Jeff Lieberman. And he's a, uh, for the last 15, 20 years, been uh, fully into the slow motion photography. So stopping time, really. And, uh, and he's like, a, he's an analyst and advisor to a lot of movies and things like that. But he's, you know, he's like, a, he's a genius in his own right. He's like a mathematician and a bunch of different things. But he's an artist and a mathematician, you know, how those people are. And he uh, and I connected and... Uh, he created this contraption that I bought and I've now been giving to friends and colleagues called the Wonder Machine. And it is, um, do I, do I, I won't ruin, I don't think I'll ruin it by describing what it does. So it, it slows down time. So you put inside of this frame, it's an empty picture frame. There's two places to put objects. It comes with feathers, but you can put in flowers or a little branch or anything that's small and has a narrow base. And then through some magic, it has to do with a strobe light and vibrating. By the strobe light, taking in the frame rate of the vibrations, you'll watch these items do this. Completely slow motion, 
of the natural activity of things that take place vastly faster than you can see with your eye. And I, I can stare at this thing for hours. It's amazing. So I saw that in, uh, on New Year. Uh, we went to celebrate New Year with, uh, uh, yes, I, I saw that. And you're right. It, it like captured my attention. I stood there just <laughs> magnetized because right. it's, it's so it, you it's almost like it's alive and it right. moves in this and you you see it moving but you kind of don't and it it it's amazing i i was i was literally hypnotized into it i can see how how i could have the environment you know 360 environment where like something like this could become an experience wow okay and so, so um, jo Jeff Lieberman. Lieberman, yes. Yeah. He invented that. Yeah. How does he do it? What is it? Do you know? I mean, I, I don't know the total, okay. method, but it has something to do with the resonant frequency of the objects being yeah. mapped to the strobe lights. And then I guess he thin slices that down so that it becomes uh, slow motion. So maybe. The object is doing this, but all you're seeing is frame rates like this. Interesting. And yeah. the object is there. I mean, that's the it's beauty real. is that it's a real object. Yeah. It was two feathers. <laughs> it was it was amazing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and now for me, it's a reminder, even though I preach this and I'm writing a book on it, but every day I have to remind myself the the precy of the book, which I didn't share, which is the value of an increment of time is not related to its duration. So the value of an increment of time is not related to its duration. That means that sometime today or next week or next month or sometime later this year, something's gonna happen in your life that will take place probably in a couple of seconds that will change the trajectory of your life forever. You went left or you didn't. You said yes or you didn't. You got off in that exit or you didn't. You got in the elevator, you didn't. You asked the girl out or you didn't. Like all of the biggest changes in our lives don't take place over months or years. They take place in moments. And this is why the Greeks have this word kairos, human time. The etymology is when everything happens at once and the trajectory is changed forever. And it comes from the moment that the archer releases the arrow. So that's the etymology. So. I mean, everything happens at once and wherever that thing's going, it's going to be different than it was before. And that's how our lives change, right? Our lives change when somebody says something to us we needed to hear right at that moment, or we say something to somebody that they needed to hear in that moment. If you like, I'll show you the most important Kairos moment of my life. Yes, please. So, you know, I was a speed skater. I went to the Olympics. Everything was good. Uh, I trained for the next Olympics and due to various factors, I ended up not making my second team. And, and I was humiliated, that's the right word. So not sad, not disappointed, humiliated. Because I felt like I'd, I'd made a promise to the world that it was gonna be this great thing. And instead I was, in my mind, a one-timer first loser. So one Olympics only, second place, first loser. And that was my identity for a decade, at least a decade. And I didn't watch the sport, I didn't talk about it. My whole life was built on this thing that was gone. And so I just, I, I did a hard divorce, I had nothing to do with it for a decade, but then, NBC called me and asked me to be the analyst for the next Olympics uh, 10 years later. And I couldn't say no to that, of course. So there I am back at the Olympics. And my job as the analyst was to interview the parents and coaches and skaters and feed them all the backstories so they could tell, talk about people during the races. So there I am. It's the 16th day of the 17 days at the Winter Olympics. And it's the night before the gold medal round for the men's relay, my event, which is short track speed skating. It's always the last day. And a parent, we're at dinner with the parents and skaters and one of the parents pulled me aside and in about 15 seconds changed the entire trajectory of my life. They said, hey, John, I just want you to know, I want you to know something that's really important. I said, okay, he looked nervous. Um, he's like, I just want you to know that we wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for you. And I said, I don't, I don't know what you mean. He's like, you won't remember. Um, but 12 years ago, after you won your silver medal, you brought it to a little reception in Bay City, Michigan. I brought my son, Alex, he was 11 years old at the time. He'd never speed skated before in his life. You put your medal around his neck, you signed an autograph, and the next day he joined the Bay City Speed Skating Club, and tomorrow he's skating in the gold medal round. 
Oh, how beautiful. And that changed everything in my life. I started coaching. I got my daughter skating. Uh, I started announcing. And most importantly, I started talking about it, which I never had. And by the way, as I think you probably know, yeah. this is all I do for a living. Yeah. I speak for a living. And I always tell this story. I've told this story to more than a half a million people around the world. And so I knew that everything was going to change that night. And so I wrote him a long, I think, windy email. Um, but he waited till he got back to write me back. And, the, you know, he really distilled it down is, uh, you know, he went back to his son's room and he saw the photo of us still on the wall of his bulletin board in his room. He went and pulled it, printed out a photo from this Olympics uh, with Alex's medal around my neck because he won a bronze medal the next day, put it back in the bulletin board and then you know, stepped back and contemplated all the things that had to have happened. And his conclusion was, I guess you'll never know what you'll do or say or not do or say that could change someone's life forever. And that's every day right now, we have that opportunity. It may or may not happen today. It might be a week, it might be a month and you might not find out, right? You don't always know how your interactions, interactions with people might have impact. Sometimes you wait 12 years, sometimes you never know. Um, but here's the cool denouement of that story is Alex and I are great friends. We ski together every winter and he lives in Utah. And uh, three years ago, right about this time, I got a call from him and he said, hey, John, I want to tell you something that's amazing. And I said, okay. And he's like, I just got off the phone with the U.S. Olympic Committee. I've accepted the head coach position for U.S. speed skating. I'll be taking the team to Pyeongchang. So all of that came from one little Kairos moment. Yeah. And if you only thought about that, right? And the, I think the beauty is, as you said, that we have opportunities to do that and to be that in in everyday life right? and every moment and especially in all of our interactions, including our loved ones. Uh, right. uh, that's one of the benefits that I think is of being of a parent is that as you watching a child grow, you can really realize that, wow, you can, you can actually continually be that and do that with your child and, and also constantly learn from that, uh, for, from them. It's amazing just kind of seeing, seeing the children and he, seeing people around, um, I, it seems that the universe gives us lessons through kind of them, and then you know expression of ourselves is just so so great. Okay, so now think about this: twenty five years from now, you are wherever. Look around, describe to me what you see, and allow it to be what you wish it will be. So if, if you have a chance to draw the picture. Well, what do you see around you and it's maybe global environment, what, whatever it is. And, and it is something that you are allowing uh, yourself to have and see and, you know, to be. Well, I've always wanted to learn to fly and I don't know what form that would take. For a long time, I thought it would be a plane, um, but that, as I learned more, that feels like a lot of the fun of flying seems to be buried in all of the minutia of the flight planning and all of the lesson taking and the worrying about the machine and the maintenance and all of that. And so that's lost some of its luster. So I, I've become more and more enamored with the idea of kite surfing because you can fly at least for brief periods. And I love being on the water and I love being in the ocean. So I'm thinking about picking that up this summer and, uh, and going with that. It's a balanced sport. So it should be relatively easy for me, I think. Um, you know, growing up doing balanced sports like skateboarding and, and skiing and skating and all that. So hopefully it's not too difficult, but that would be something I could see myself doing even, even then. Because the beauty of certain sports like skiing, like cycling, and very much unlike basketball, soccer, is some sports you can do forever because it's all about repetitive motions that are fluid and they require skill, not strength. And so, you know, my parents up until last year were still skiing in their late seventies. Wow. Because they can, because they know how, right? And so I would hope that this is a sport like that where once you learn how to do it, it's not about root strength and it's definitely not about stop, start, jump, you know, banging on, onto things, it's smooth and fluid. So, you know, I'm choosing to do all more and more fluid sports going forward because you can do them forever. 
Does it remind you about flow? Is the feeling of the flow you think and kind of because every move is kind of different, right? Even if you're going through the same track, there are so many variables around the flow kind of sports. Well, as uh, Michele Cheek sent me high once said that the entire pursuit of the human race for all of millennia has been the flow state, and I think he's right. Um, you probably know this, but if you can get yourself into the flow state, you emit uh, epinephrine, serotonin, dopamine, ondanamide, and oxytocin in that order. And as Stephen Kotler would say, if you took those externally, it would leave you dead or drooling. And <laughs> you them naturally, it creates the most intoxicating state known to mankind. And so, you know, seeking to get into the flow state is, uh, I think, something we all seek. And, you know, something like uh, kite surfing has risk elements, it has danger elements. It has skill elements, it has all these things and beauty and physical intensity and emotional intensity that all can stack together to create those time stopping moments. So that's my hypothesis for now. Interesting. That's funny. You'd be either dead or drooling. <laughs> <laughs> the power of indigenous production of, of the states for us, I think to me, is so amazing. Often people seek that exogenous stimuli, but we have all of this amazing uh, chemicals and chemical releases inside of us that uh, I think that are the, the cocktails that we indigenously can stimulate ourselves to do is I think we're still learning. Yeah. I was, I've been doing, so when everything closed down, um, I found myself um, doing maybe an hour and a half to two hours of meditating every day. Um, and I it, and it was specifically stimulated by alkaline breathing, which believed to release your DMT in your lungs. And um, and it, you know, so I mean, I spent th those those almost three months of the shutdown. To me, I spent doing all kinds of a breathing, integrating, and really kind of uploading and downloading consciousness or something i i don't even know what it but to me it's amazing that we have so many tools inside of us that can that can take us into the states that you know i would never have experienced continuously the state that alkaline breathing was able to place me into um in in a meditative state in a consistent, uh, you know, kind of a production. The interesting part to me uh, now, and I, I, you know, my goal is to still do it every day. I'm, I don't, uh, um, but you know, we, we kind of worked over to that. Was the beauty of uh, every shutdown because it was like, okay, well, okay, um, what do I do? <laughs> so, so to me, it was alkaline breathing in my lighthouse, uh, uh, which I, I converted my greenhouse for. Um, for meditation room and, you know, set up all my things that I brought from all over the world that I, you know, gong and everything from, just from travels, right? And and that's, that's what I've been wondering, you know, what, what else is there? How else can we incorporate the tools that nature gifted us to which we basically don't tap a lot of people don't tap or we don't tap or, uh, and so my question for you now would be, is there, is there kind of a, a quick start that you use for yourself? So for me, I do alkaline breathing real quick, you know, and I can plug in into momentum and I can wake up and kind of a consciously stay in and catch the, you know, the flow or, but I think that's what it is. It's a flow. Uh, but is there is there tools that you use that kind of a puts you in a in a state of that momentum? Yeah. So you know this will be in the book. There's really to me sort of six elements that each independently is very useful for I'd say altering your people will say it is altering your state of consciousness. I don't use those terms. I try to stay away from anything that will push away the types of audience that need to hear this the most. Yeah. Think of it as your white collar corporate workers, right? They don't want to hear consciousness. They don't want to they hear- don't want to Because the, the, the definition for them, they think it's they, something they, that- they, they, they fade away from anything woo-woo, right? 
So I never talk about purpose. I never talk about consciousness. I never talk about spirituality, but they're all hidden. It's all Trojan horse, right? Because as I go through these six, you'll see all of these lead down those paths, but I never tell them that. So they don't ever get their shields up moment. Yeah. And so I Trojan horse my way in and they figure it out on their own. So it all works out fine. Um, the first is uniqueness. So finding unique things to do, ways to do things that are unique. Um, and, you know, repetition is the enemy. And uh, uh, sorry, routine is the enemy. Um, repetition and routine are the enemy. Um, not to say we won't have routines in our lives, but certain routines we can make into rituals. So I, as an eight, with an eight-year-old daughter, I'm quite certain that putting her to bed, specifically when she was two to five, was not a routine, it was a ritual. The difference it being- It still is, it still is. I'm so, I'm so <laughs> blessed to hold on to it and she aging you know, and becoming more independent. Right. I'm realizing even more how much of a ritual it is and how it, I, I treasure every single evening right. when I put her to bed. I, it, it, At some point it will end and that's- No, I know. Well, Don't tell me that. <laughs> but, you know, whatever, you can, whatever routines you can turn into rituals, they add value, they add meaning, they layer in memory over time. It might not be a specific memory, but it's still a stack of useful memories. So um, uniqueness, uh, risk, intentionally bringing risk into your life uh, is where life is at. Otherwise, our brain is not going to write it down. And even if it writes it down, it might not be recallable. So even if you write down a memory, but you can't find it, it's also gone, in my opinion, unless you have a really good hypnotherapist. Um, so um, uniqueness, risk, beauty uh, of any sort, right? Whether it's nature, which is a really great source, um, or music or even a conversation, like beauty comes in many different forms, right? Um, all the senses, taste, food, wine, whatever. Uh, physical intensity and type two fun, I would say in particular. Uh, emotional intensity. I, had a, I was doing a, my first version of a TED, my TED talk about time and I was walking up a mountain in Mexico with a great friend of mine. And I was like, you know, you have to take risks. You have to do things that make you uncomfortable if you're going to remember them because of that risk, the brain decides not to write it down. And she stops and she's like, oh dear. And I'm like, what? She's like, I just got invited literally yesterday to sing at a, con a, a, a gathering, 5,000 people at this couple of day event. And I, I said, no. And she's like, you're going to make me do this, aren't you? I'm like, yeah, hell, yes, you have to do it. She's like, but I haven't sang in years. You know, I don't know if my voice is still there. This, is gonna, this has the potential to be a disaster. I'm like, that's why it's perfect. So she had six weeks to prepare. She called me, I think three or four weeks later in tears saying, I'm not ready. This is gonna be a disaster. And we laughed off the stage. It's gonna be the worst day of my life. I managed it. And then she called me two weeks later and said, yesterday was one of the best days of my adult life. And uh, the last six weeks are the most memorable six weeks of the last 10 years. Because she took the risk, right? You don't get the reward if you don't put yourself out there. And you won't remember it if you don't take the risk and get the reward and so forth. And so she had all of it, right? She had risk. It was unique. It was physically intense. It was emotionally intense. She got into the flow state. So that's the sixth one is getting into flow. She nailed it. And she created a bank of memories in the course of 15 minutes till she remember her whole life. There's a before and after. Those are the signatures of these, what I call event horizon events, okay. uh, is there's a before and after. And so when you have a yardstick of time in your mind and you have more notches, I mean, I've had people say, I don't remember the 2000s. A whole decade is gone because they didn't do anything unique. They went to the same job with the same commute, with the same coworkers doing the same work, the same places on vacation, same places for same restaurants and nothing new was written down and so it was lost so those six things i think are the key triggers to alter your, and i'll use your word alter your uh sense of presence your sense of time and what you write down yeah and, and 
like to clarify to me consciousness is our awareness uh, yeah. so i mean in the, i i do i believe people it for some there's some words that seem to be uh, um you know kind of a like you said they put the garters on but i mean and to me, the same with dimensions right so there are different dimensions of perception it's a mathematical and physical thing um and i i've i've watched um I watched the presentation about basically different dimensions, you know, your point, your, 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 you know, your two, your three, your four, and it got to 22. I can tell you, I had no idea because they were drawing, it's all models of a perspective, right? It's all just a model of perspective. And I sat there for more than half of it wondering, I'm not sure what they're saying. <laughs> I cannot imagine. I'm sure it's like through repetition, I could maybe get myself to advance to those perceptions. But it was really interesting uh, uh, to, to see that it's just kind of like a mathematical modeling of awareness and the perception. And then also it was humbling to see that, you know, as for me, as smart as I think I am, <laughs> I did not get far in following and then just sat there staring at them you know, at, at the presentation being like, okay, I have no idea what these all points and lines are. And, but I, I must say, I saw it to 22, set through that physics and mathematics uh, uh, presentation and walked out with uh, um, understanding that how interesting it would be to push those perceptions of just kind of a seeing from, uh, from different perspective. Well, thank you so much. It's it's so good to see you and thank you for sharing. And I really appreciate everything you said. Um, for me personally, I was taking notes because when I take notes, it, I, it writes into my mind and I wanted to make sure I download all of this. And, uh, um, and thank you for sharing for that with the viewers. I do think that right now, Right now, we do have this very special, uh, unique opportunity in our hands to to be able to create those rituals and make and make as, as what I heard you said, it make a ritual out of creating momentum and being aware that you also creating momentum for yourself, but also you creating you have opportunity to create a momentum for for others as well and it's it's thank you thank you for sharing that it's my my mind is is flying all over the place as far as openness uh, um it's a great great reminder and i'm sure our viewers will really appreciate it because i do know that a lot are a lot of people are struggling right now inside of their inside of their selves trying to figure out how to deal with these changes and knowing that these changes are actually a, a tools to which you can anchor your your experiences new experiences and create momentums and create more libraries of beautiful and amazing impactful memories what a what a great perspective um, before i let you go i would love for you to share one book that you think that Basically, everybody should read. Oh, that's easy. <clears throat> Most impactful book I've ever read, Times 10. Um, and it used to be uh, Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt. Um, and I still love that book, don't get me wrong. And I, I love Jonathan. But uh, the most impactful book I've ever read is called Behave by Dr. Robert Sapolsky, who is both a, a neuroscientist and an endocrinologist. And he examines why humans behave the way they do. So he starts with the neuroscience of neurons and axons and the electrochemical impulses, and then the endocrine system, and, you know, serot the role of serotonin and dopamine between the synapses. So he starts in the milliseconds and he moves to seconds, and then he moves to minutes, and then he moves to hours and days and months and years and millennia, and he gets into DNA, and then he sh paints you a picture of why anybody does anything they do. Pretty much, I feel like nothing is surprising to me after reading that book in terms of the way people behave. It's all programmed. It's either programmed in the short term or the midterm or the long term or through the way they were raised or 
I'll, I'll leave you with one really amazing, like of the many facts in the book. We tend to think of ourselves as, you know, the only species capable of something as complex as say moral reasoning. Uh, but actually monkeys have moral reasoning. So he, he devised this experiment, I'm pretty sure it was him, where he gave, he trained these monkeys that if they brought him a pebble, he would give them either a, a carrot or a banana. Carrots are okay, they, they're fine. They'll do the pebble for the carrot, but they really love the banana, right? And so we'd bring them in pairs and he, they'd bring both bring a pebble, he'd give them both a carrot, they're fine, they walk away, they eat the carrot. And they'd bring, both bring a pebble, he gives them the banana, they're a little more excited, but they walk away and they, now he gives one the carrot and one the banana. The carrot monkey, well, we'll start with the banana monkey. The banana monkey throws it down in contempt because that's not fair to his buddy. And the carrot monkey throws it at him. <laughs> <laughs> so they have a sense of fairness and that we've inherited. So just so many stories from the books to understand, you know, where do we get the behaviors that we have? Some of them are very ancient. Some of them are relatively new. And uh, when you're done with the book, you, you have a really vastly superior understanding of why some of the mayhem in the world happens. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing this and for sharing your time and for, for being, and I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing you soon. I, I do believe that, I, I hope that I see you as one of the um, restarting conferences. Um, you know, I, I know that we have plenty of nature that we can responsibly gather up and network. And uh, it's actually, I think, much more pleasant than, uh, you know, being inside of the conference and, and hallways and all that we have and what i love about the the reality of our life we have amazing technology so we can have speakers <laughs> that we can blast into the fields and also we have displays that if somebody has to have a social distancing they can still can see and hear and also there's such a things as masks that people can wear too to you know, we, we, we have all the tools to safely and gather better. So um, so I, I, I sure hope to see you in person soon because there is something special about about being together and, and, and gathering with responsibility. Um, and I hope that I hope that your adventures keep on going and I'm really looking forward to seeing all the updates on the Facebook because I, they're just so beautiful. Your photography and your creativity also is, is just amazing. It seems that you have a very technical way of looking and seeing the world and to the point, then you have this beautiful creativity and vision of, of beauty and expression. And so thank you for that. Very inspiring. <laughs> have thank a, you. yes, thank have a wonderful one. Thank Sorry. you for having me on. Of course, of course. I, I it's my honor. Uh, it's it's simply my honor, and uh, it's great what you're doing. And I love your perspective. And um, I'll just share with you too and viewers. I am a, a more of a person who skis who doesn't want to fall down. <laughs> you know. So I like that that my the risk for me is just going down the mountain. That feels plenty enough. That's all you need. <laughs> so it's so inspirational to remember that that risk is is kind of a calculated risk and everybody has a calculated risk. So, you know, for me throwing myself into the throwing some blades on my on my feet and throwing myself down the um, scary slides, uh, um, you know, the ice, uh, probably too much, <laughs> but going going safely down the mountain and falling, falling onto the side uh, into the powder is preferred. So, but it, there's always that risk. There's always that ability for us to push ourselves a little bit more. And you are such a great a uh, great reminder of that. So thank you so much and have a wonderful day. You too.